finals are almost over. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, uh, the, the warriors and, uh, Mavs, you know, we put a valiant effort against them, but you know, I think a little bit of the experience came in and kind of down the stretch and they've been there. I mean, you can obviously see it against these Celtics, uh, but it's three, two, uh, golden state is up, um, heading back to Boston. Yep. What's your kind of thoughts? Cause I picked Boston in the beginning and seven. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I said, I I thought they can get it six. I guess I got a little geeked up when they won game one. Um, But now they're going back to Boston. Who do you think? Do you think that the Golden State Warriors close this out or do you think it goes to seven and Golden State and DDP? Who are you going with? Well, it's an interesting setup there because, you know, Boston, their last game they lost was the first time they've lost back to back since like January. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Um remarkably consistent and while you might be inclined to say then well then what are the odds they lose a third straight that doesn't seem very high but usually when you have a run like that it's not like the wheels fall off a little at a time it's not like you get a little chip in the armor and it keeps kind of going along sometimes the the issues are more endemic than that you know the warriors winning by double digits in a game in which curry for the first time in his playoff career fails to knock down a three that's not good for boston I also right. think that you got to take advantage of that. Right. Right. Uh, I also think that, you know, game six clay is real. <laughs> I've, I've witnessed it. Um, you know, my secondary team being the thunder, I've, I witnessed that in horror <laughs> in 2016. Mm-hmm. So, right. I, I know it's real. Uh, he right. Like 10 or 11 threes in that game. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I, I look at what golden state has and this golden state team. They're not, Flawless by any means, but they are very, very sound defensively, and they still have still have a, a dynamic offense that can give you troubles. And I just don't know that Boston, they're not really built in a traditional way, right? Like smart plays point guard, but they don't really have like a true point guard, it feels like. Mm-hmm. And so at times they can feel a little discombobulated. Like their their three guys are great. That's a great trio but it kind of feels like they don't have that floor general that they've, they've looked for. And they've tried some things, right? They had Kyrie, they had mm-hmm. um, they bet, bet big on Kimball Walker. Like mm-hmm. they've tried different stuff and it's, it's great that these guys got here, but I don't know. I, I feel like Golden State is probably going to pull away with this. Now it might still go seven, but Golden State's another one of those teams that they've answered the call every time the playoffs when they've lost. I don't think they've lost back to back yet. So uh, I would say at this point, with them having gotten game five, I'm probably leaning in that direction. And that makes me think it's probably fair to say that Golden State was the one team I don't think Dallas could have bounced. Now, going into the series, I felt good. But after mm-hmm. watching the first three games, yeah, you know, I like, know, you yeah, know, they'll be lucky to get one because they look like they're just out of juice. Right. And, um, you know, even if they even if they had a little bit of fuel left in the tank, even if they had a little more depth, like Hardaway had been back and available, I don't know that they would have overcome that necessarily. Austin, I still think Dallas could have gone toe to toe with Boston in one and six or one and seven. I don't know that they would have even at full strength this season gotten past Golden State. I don't know that they were quite there. It, it's an interesting, interesting hypothetical for sure. I, I just think the Warriors have a little bit more bring to the table here and their depth is so fantastic yeah um i think also it's the coaching i think uh steve kerr has been there and done that I, i've seen good coaching this season um i've seen good coaching in this playoffs for him and i think he has the, the experience factor is starting to come in there but let's uh i'll agree with you as far as i you know we talked about this before and i even said this with dallas that jordan pool and you know wiggins has been balling but jordan pool has really, to me, been a difference for them because it allows Steph Curry not to be on ball all the time. You know what I mean? And when he's not, not doesn't have to be on ball, bringing the ball up court every single time and he can get off those screens, it's made a world of difference. You know what I mean? I, I feel like he's been the deciding factor as Jordan Poole because he can do a lot of things. I felt like he was one of the things that gave the Mavericks trouble because of his penetration, how he could set up uh, Curry, um, Clay Thompson, and those guys. And he's been doing it. Um, and I agree with you with the point guard position with – um, Boston, because you do see that when they come down, 
And when Tatum brings the ball up court or uh, Jalen Brown, they do seem discombobulated because they have to get into a different type of offense. And those guys are looking to score more than really get the offensive going. So then when they shoot a wild shot, it falls into the other team, especially Golden State's favorite. You feel what I'm saying? Yep. Um, so up, I'm going to give you. Way, we got 100 people in the chat. Yeah, it's going crazy. Chat going crazy. And we appreciate you guys. We love that you guys are up in here. Drop a We're like, subscribe. To- all that good stuff. Keep on coming. Pick up your feet. Hang around for a bit. Yes, sir. Hit that like button. But I got a question before you before we uh, talked about these Cowboys, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm listening to a lot of people in the chat right now. They're doing they're doing great, making a lot of great comments. But what, uh, what's your thoughts on this, DDP? If Dallas had Tim Hardaway Jr. and Christian Wood, do you think the Mavs would have uh, got past a Golden State? Uh, so this playoff series, if the Mavericks had had Christian Wood on the roster and Hardaway had been healthy, could they have gotten past them? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you just look at, like, if you're talking about this hypothetical here of like the same Christian Wood trade having been made just previous deadline, basically, then yeah, I think so. Because you're adding, you're getting another three point shooter, which they needed another inside presence, which you needed. And um, Hardaway, obviously, was additional firepower off the bench, who was your second best player on the postseason last year, was sensational for probably five of those seven games against L.A. last year. Um, If you have that in your arsenal. I think you got a shot for sure. Now, is that a guarantee? No, but I do think that you'd have a uh, a chance at doing that. Now, how Golden State would attack Christian Wood to try and play him off the floor that would be interesting. I'd be curious to see kind of what they do there, but it's definitely the best, the best kind of uh, adjustment um, Dallas could make. I think given the, the possibilities, I, I know Atlanta, as Jeff points out in the chat, um, Atlanta is reportedly open to the idea of dealing John Collins. That's, that's great. But like, there's no way you have the cap to do anything. Right. You don't have the flexibility. If they're making any other substantial moves in terms of dollars and cents this offseason, I think it's just going to be re-signing Brunson. And unless Brunson suddenly pushes hard for like $30 million or something a season, I think he's here in Dallas. But I don't think he's going to like try and I hope he does over a barrel on that. I think he's going to be willing to to work in that 22 to 24 range and you Dallas. still get money. Yeah. You feel I, me? Not to cut you off, but 22, 23 million is, a year is not bad. So I uh, just, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just good. kind of flowing, flowing off of that is just, yeah, Jalen. I mean, sometimes you got to look at it and say, are we, I, I'm, I love it here. Mm-hmm. I, I got the friendship. I'm going to get paid. It's not like I'm going to get paid peanuts. And you saw what we did, and we just added a big man who we definitely feel like. I'm, come on, Jalen. I know you got to do you, Jalen, but if you hear this show, don't do that. <laughs> Get your 22 or 23 bill and stay on here, man. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, I think there's a good chance he does, but that would be my guess for the, the biggest remaining move Dallas still makes. Now, I'm not going to rule anything out. But I would be stunned if they found a way to to get into something else. Because if you think about it, like all of the quote unquote like parts and pieces that you had that you could say like, OK, how do we make the biggest single improvement to our roster without having to give up anything of real value? You just did it. You just sold off all the, the all the little scrap pieces. Uh, more. I keep saying more. Sterling Brown. Uh, Brown. Bolbon again, love Bolbon, but he just doesn't play into the big picture of what this team needed to do. Um, pick 26, which again, there were some intriguing options there that I was curious about. And he certainly got me interested and hyped up for a few of those guys, but you're not going to expect a rookie to come in or even a second year guy to come in and really make that next step for you there. So this is a, a good way to be aggressive. And, uh, the uh, was it? Oh yeah, Trey Burke, who basically didn't have a role in this team for ninety percent of the season anyway. If he did, it was just eat up minutes while they were going through COVID hell, and that was ironic too, considering his stance on that. That kind of put him on a hot seat. So, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just not. There's not a lot there now. Big Fat Winner does make a good point. They do have um, 
a trade exception worth $11 million, but it expires, I believe, draft weekend. So mm -hmm. they do still have some options. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually probably worth segment here in the near future. I have a chance to take a deeper dive on that and see realistically what you have there. Right. But, um, and if they did something with that, first of all, that would be refreshing as hell because the last couple of times the Mavericks have had like $10 million trade exceptions and shit, they've just mm -hmm. let them expire. And that's in fear. Um, so if they actually found a way to do something with that, then, uh, then I'm fully bought in on this new front office at least in terms of like management and uh, strategy and everything that's that's masterful to back up a deal like this with pulling off something a quality move with that 11 million dollar trade yeah well we well like i said we're going to see it's a lot of a lot of interesting things opened up now uh with that trade options um now i'm looking at a few things in the uh few in the chat and i've seen a question right here and i'm gonna ask you this as well i don't mm -hmm. think it happens uh but where is it at um i think cameron carp says or someone i can't remember who said but they were asking about uh jeff harbis he's asked that uh you know remember how zach levine has been yeah. in the air um, I don't think that happens now. No, I didn't late, think it was going to happen I before. That anyway was that he's likely to sign with Chicago a new deal. Yeah, that was like yesterday. I, I, think I didn't. I, saw that. I didn't want. I didn't want that because I don't. I didn't feel like he would take the uh, Mavericks over the hump. And if you kept a Hardaway Junior. and you kept a Dinwiddie, mm -hmm. I feel like that's okay. I, I really do. I feel like yes, you're going to be a defensive liability with Hardaway. We already know all that, uh, but. I still feel like you're okay because I just feel you don't need, like you said, I don't feel like Dallas, the way Luke is construct, constructed with Luka, you need all these other superstars around him. You need very good players around him. And I think hopefully the Dallas Mavericks continue to see that and it, it will take him to the le next level and you don't have to break the bank every time because I just feel like one of those type guys like a lack of Zach Levine would just throw off the Dallas Mavericks cheat. Let's not do that. Let's keep away is, and we got a familiarity, DDP. We have Luca playing with Hardaway Jr. for, what, two or three years now. You know what I'm saying? So yep. we have those core guys that have played with each other. So now you got a little group. Let's keep that group like you have a Memphis Grizzlies. They don't have a bunch of superstars, but guess what? They had the one guy, Jay Morant. They got a lot of good, solid guys around them, and look what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, they, they've also done a great job through the draft of getting a lot of They've invested well and smart there, and that's something Dallas just has not done a lot of. So I guess that would be sort of the, I don't know if counter argument is the right thing, but I, I would say still a, a difference between these teams that's worth noting. But yeah, um, continuity is not a bad thing. Like I know the Mavericks really sold us hard a couple of years ago on this idea of cultivating continuity. That was the phrase they used um, when their only offseason move were to max out KP and then get a... I think it was a three for nine. No, it was like a three for 16 or four for 16, four for 16 um, for Seth Curry, which, by the way, would be such absurd value at this point. <laughs> I'm still mad about um, dealing him to the 76 for Richardson. Me too, man. That's so this ridiculous. Hurts. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite recent Mavericks, that other than like talking about like role players, uh, one of my favorites in years still hurts me a little bit, but yeah, it's it's pretty impressive um, to consider that, but I don't know. Well, I went off on a tangent and I scrambled to find my way back. What was the original question? Oh, uh, we was just talking about <laughs> Zach. <laughs> we were talking Zach about Levine. Zach Levine yeah. being, yeah. being added. I see a few other people because we're about to swing over to these Cowboys, but I want to ask you one last thing on, on this uh you know, we talked about, I think it was Mo Bamba. I think mm -hmm. me and you, you brought him up. Yeah, we talked I about him. I see some people, I see people in the chat. Would that be an option? Even if you got a Christian Wood, would you do that? Uh, I agree with Ranger King. He, he's not exactly an agile player. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some of the other questions are whether or not you could actually get him at like the MLE level, mid-level exception, or a veteran or anything like that. I don't know that you would have someone's going to give him probably a better deal than that. That's why I said he's an option, but I, I, I think he's worth kicking the tires on just because of his unique skill set and size and what he brings to the table. And if you're bringing him in to be a role player, then yeah, it's worth kicking the 
he going to tire us for? Now, is he going to help you in like a hypothetical playoff series like we've just been discussing here, like the Warriors or something? No, because they're going to play <laughs> his ass off the floor. But uh, it's it's still something where it's like, you know, it's a uh, it's a it's a prospect. I feel like if you can get a, a portable deal, you kind of have to try. Like if you can get a guy like that who's got a high ceiling, you kind of have to. 